You know the feeling when your mate's golf ball flies past yours? Or when you're on the green in regulation, but he holds it from the bunker? At Drummond Golf, we get it. That's why we have our lowest price guarantee. As Australia's biggest, you can count on our massive buying power for the lowest prices in golf. But if you do happen to find a lower advertised price, we'll beat it. The Drummond Golf lowest price guarantee. Unbeatable. Conditions apply. Hello and welcome to episode 93 of The Thing About Golf, Golf Australia Magazine's fortnightly attempt to answer that eternal question, what draws people so strongly to this game? Now let's start this episode with a question. What are the similarities between driving a race car at more than 250 kilometres an hour and trying to find a narrow fairway off the tee at a crucial time in a professional golf tournament? The answer, of course, is nothing. Which begs the next question, how does one person become good enough at both to call each his profession? And the answer to that is what we're going to explore today. Thomas Mesra's life story is as fascinating as his professional one. Born in what was then called Czechoslovakia, he showed promise as a downhill skier as a teenager and dreamt of going to the Olympics. But at some point in his life, cars took centre stage, and after eventually escaping the communist regime... He found his place in motor racing in Europe. It was around this time a friend introduced him to golf, a game he admits he was hopeless at at first, but he caught the bug and he was hooked. Fast forward some 30 years to a hugely successful racing career, one that included being a teammate of the legendary Peter Brock, who capturing Australia's most prestigious production car race at the Bathurst 1000, and Mesra changed course. On a whim, he entered the Legends to a Q school in 2011 and got his card. And for the 12 years since, he's had the great privilege of calling himself a professional golfer. It's a genuinely intriguing tale, and quite the journey, and one I hope that you enjoy listening to as much as I did. Thomas Mazira, I think you might be our first multi-sport guest on uh, The Thing About Golf, so thank you for taking some time. We do really appreciate it. Let's start right at our jumping off point. What is The Thing About Golf for Thomas Mazira? Ah, oh, well... <laughs> Yeah, it's something I discovered, I suppose, in my later stage. And uh, I was uh, 30 years old and uh, and purely by accident. And, uh, you know, from the first day, I, I tried the game. Uh, I never forget that. I was playing in England. We went on public course and uh, yeah, hack around for about six hours and 150 shots later. <laughs> 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 about 10 lost balls, you know, we, we finish and uh, and I got hooked on it from so that day. From that day. So yeah. all, all yeah. those wasted years is the first thing you think, isn't it? Well, <laughs> you know, I didn't think about it back then, but uh, when you sort of get a little bit better and uh, then you think, oh, oh, yeah, I wish I would have started a little earlier because uh, same as anything, you know, that's – I suppose that's why we go to school when we're young because we we learn <laughs> we have like learn. sponge we take everything in and uh, and I right. I learned to play tennis as a kid and uh, and I learned to ski snow ski as a kid and uh, you sort of under- and I was pretty good at it. Say, you're yeah. underselling then, uh, yourself there, aren't you? By saying you learned to ski and learned to play tennis, yeah. you were national standard in Czechoslovakia, which I can imagine wouldn't have been yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah, no, I, probably, I think I was about fifteen or sixteen. I, uh, I came uh, came second in a Czech championship in a slalom, and then. Uh, which, which was pretty good, which was pretty good. And uh, my dream was sort of, you know, to, to make it to the Olympics. Olympics. Yeah, that's the uh, same as any sportsman in those days. Yeah. You know, the Olympics is the pinnacle. It doesn't matter if it's the swimmers in Australia no, exactly right. or skiers, in, you know, in, uh, in, in Czechoslovakia back then. And uh, It's why they but, get up at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning and go to the pool, isn't oh, it? That's, well, what, that's no fun, but if yeah, it can get you to any, the Olympics, it's worth it. Any, any sport to make it to some reasonable level, then uh, you got to put in, and uh, it, it's a hard work. And then, uh, lots of people just see the end product. But, yeah, that's uh, right. We'll, we'll to come get to that. There, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some of the lessons yeah. you might have learned about professional and, uh, golf. Most of our listeners, some will be familiar with you from the Legends Tour, the Seniors Tour here in Australia, but my, many more will find your name familiar from motor racing. 
Oh, yeah, of course. Like, I, I, I was, uh, you know, I was reasonably good, you know, I could, could make a living out of it. And, uh, won Bathurst? I, um, I won Bathurst in, uh, Jesus, coming to about 35 90, years, you know, 90, 1988. 88. Yeah. The bicentennial. Yeah. Big yeah. Year. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you drove so actually across the, you took the checkered flag, if I'm not mistaken? Yes, I did. Yeah. That's yeah, a big deal. Yeah, I well, think. you know, I was, uh, I was driving with, uh, with Tony Longhurst. It's an, uh, you know, not a, Queenslander here from Gold Coast and uh, and uh, you know like it was Tony's team Tony and Frank Gardner team and they they never thought the car would last that long then <laughs> then Tony just made a stint that uh, you know I did the last stint because he thought the car sort of would shit itself by then or or we hang it on a wall or something like that but we sort of kept going and kept going and kept going and then at the end uh, you, you know, I had to jump in it for the last, uh, I don't know, 30 laps or something. And uh, and I remember Frank Gardner back then, you know, like when I was climbing into a car, like he said, listen, pal, <laughs> keep it on a track. You, you hang it on a wall, I'll kick your ass all the way back to England. You know, cause I was living in England those days. And, uh, yeah, and it sort of came together. And, um, yeah, it was great. And uh, and I, I never think big deal yeah, because I, I wasn't sort of I didn't grow up in Australia. Is you there know, an the, awareness the, of the Bathurst One Thousand outside oh, the show? Or is it really well, a local? back then? Uh, yeah, it started to get bit right. notice in uh, in uh, in Europe because uh, previous year they had that uh, uh, was it a World Touring Car Championship in there yeah, in eighty seven? Yeah, funny period wasn't it? Yeah, all yeah, sorts of yeah, cars correct. Yeah, and yeah. and, like and that sort of you know got. Got Bud has a bit more now mm. in uh, in Europe and uh, but for me like uh, yeah it was it was another race. Well, and, you uh, were a, and, uh, at the time probably what we might consider a journeyman golf pro now, weren't you? You were going to all corners of the globe to race cars to make a living. Have I got that? Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Like I, you know, like my story. I, I came to Australia in 1979 and uh, started racing in here and. And did reasonably well in the ju- junior categories, and uh, that sort of earned me the ticket to go to race in uh, in England with a little bit of backing from here. And uh, and then I raced there. I went there for what they call the race of champions because that uh, in a junior category, which was Formula Ford, the uh, Ford Motor Company put actually big money up. Mm-hmm. And uh, the champions of that category from all over the world, they were invited to go to England. Well, big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then uh, it's like from, you know, Brazil and US and Canada and all that and all the bloody countries, uh, Africa. And uh, unbelievable, like 26 cars on the grid. And uh, they that's are, cr- they that's crazy. Open, open yeah, wheel yeah, 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 yeah. No protection. Yeah, if you yeah, flipped yeah, it, yeah. that's it. You'd yeah, just yeah, be cut yeah, in half. It. It just... That's it, yeah, yeah. Then uh, You can't imagine and, uh, them allowing it in this day and age, can you? Uh, well, no, like it's, uh, it's, it's safer than you think, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> it do- it yeah, doesn't yeah, look it. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look it, yeah. But uh, no, and that, you know, I went, went there to do one race and uh, – and I, I did reasonable, and then uh, kind of got noticed. I ended up staying there for five years, and uh, and while I was in there, then uh, then I came back to to drive in in Bathurst with Tony, and uh, so and like after the race, I, you know, like back on a plane, and yeah, Monday. I, I had some it. testing on Wednesday, you know, like after the race yeah. in here. Then uh, for me, it wasn't a sort of a big deal back then, but. Uh, but now it is because everyone sort of associates me. Oh yeah, like he won, but has, he must be very good. And then, uh, oh, uh, well, used to be. But in uh, fairness, you must be. I, I, I know that you're not one oh, to yeah, beat yeah, your yeah, own yeah, chest, yeah. but that's not a small achievement, is it? Particularly in a car that wasn't expected to win. That's a long race. It's an endurance test of the car and the drivers and the team that looks after it to nurse. They used to talk constantly on the company about nursing the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nursing yeah, The cars then yeah. weren't like what they are now, were they? No, Huge, no, heavy are. things, chew-through tyres, brakes that probably weren't good enough for the weight of the car and the speed that they were. You really had it, to drive them. It's uh, Yeah, it was a little bit more to it. And, uh, and also, those days, you had uh, 
different classes there as well. Like you had 55 cars on a grid. Little ones in the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Little yeah. cortinas and, and, that you and, have and to they're, they're, No, it wasn't a cortina. Not, not that old. <laughs> mate. Then, uh, no, like the Toyota Corollas and, uh, and a little BMW M3s and, and all those things. And, uh, and uh, you know, they were sort of strong in one part of the track, but not that strong in the other part of the track. And, uh, you know, you, you come across those things uh, at the wrong spot, you know, cost you the time. And that, like you had to sort of uh, think ahead a little bit yeah. uh, ju- just to make sure you you can go through all these uh, slower cars the with, without, yeah, without minimum uh, loss of time and uh, without taking the risks. Then, uh, yeah, it, it, it's sort of more to it than just, just you know, pushing yeah. on the pedals and, yeah. and turning the wheel. <laughs> Two yeah. turns and a swish, Arnold. Yeah, 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 yeah. Am I drawing too long a bow to say there's some correlation between that driving and golf of the time, which would have been played with persimmon clubs, pilata balls, and blade irons? Oh, uh, well, no, that, I, I wouldn't know. I, I can't. You never use I, I, can't, I can't go into it because no. I never bloody hit the ball with those things. And for me, it's hard enough to hit the ball with, the, <laughs> well, with these, what they call easy clubs yes. to hit in, yeah, hit, hit with. And then, uh, but no, no, I, I wouldn't think there is, you know, not much between uh, between motor racing and uh, and golf. Like, you know, you make a mistake in motor racing, you know, you it hurts, it hurts. <laughs> it's not, hurt a bo- it's not a bogey or a double. Yeah, is yeah, it? yeah, yeah. In, in golf, you, you just drop another ball. Yeah, <laughs> then uh, it's uh, it's easier. Yeah, yeah it's easier. Yeah. I want to come back to golf in a moment, but I do want to get some of your backstory, which I wasn't aware of. Most people who have an understanding of motor racing will be, but. An extraordinary tale, growing up in Czechoslovakia, an Eastern Bloc communist country at the time, which was not a particularly nice place to live in many ways, and you escaped, you fled from there. How old were you? And tell us a bit about that, because that's a that's not an easy decision to make, I would mani- imagine. Well, uh, you know, it was easy for me those days, because uh, I, I was just about 20, and uh just and, uh, young enough to have no idea. What yeah, you're yeah, doing. yeah, yeah. Like you think, you know, everything's easy, and uh, you know, you look back at those things. You know, what, what you did when you were young, and you said, "Jesus, you were very <laughs> stupid," you know, doing things like that. But uh, yeah, yeah. At those days, like uh, I, I can tell you, I was, I was absolutely mad about cars, and I, and I wanted to race cars. And uh, Where that, did that, that come was, from, Thomas? In oh, I had no book. idea. Like it was a kind of a dream. You know, was car racing big in Czechoslovakia? Not, was it on not TV really, or not really. But we racing? we got at one stage we got some uh, Formula One races on TV, right? Like in the mid uh, early mid seventies, something like that. And uh, and uh, yeah, but even before that, I you know always trying to get the magazines and the books about uh, Formula One and about. Uh, Car racing and uh, was it always and, racing, and, or were you interested in mechanics? Did you? No, 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 racing. Just it racing. was just, you just cars racing. Up, didn't want to strip down no, 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 and no, 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 I didn't want to do that. No, no, I was forced to do it then later. <laughs> but no, I, I just just want to do want to do racing, and uh, it was like a little childhood dream. And uh, my dad always thought I'm a bloody idiot, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, he cannot do it, you know. It's for a rich people and all that, and then. Uh, but I, I have to say that I uh, I did anything I could trying to get to a point. Like I wanted to go to Formula One, but you know I never did it. I failed at that. But uh, but I made it sort of far enough, mm-hmm. you know, for uh, many years, you know, making a reasonable living out of it. I never got rich, but made reasonable living out of it, and uh, and made lots of friends. And uh, live here on the Gold Coast. And, uh, so you're rich yeah, in many ways. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Then, well, it's uh, turned it, out okay, it, I guess. It, it's sort of. And even these days, you know, when I stopped racing, I uh, I uh, I work for Porsche to run the driving school, and that's one thing I probably never would have done if I didn't do my racing. Then, uh, sort of indirectly, you know, still the the racing helped me to do to do things uh, in the older age when uh, when I stopped racing, and uh, it's sort of a knockoff from that. As you would now know, having been, I think it's nearly 10 years you've been playing on the Legends Tour now, 2011? 12 years. 12 years, 2011 12 12 qualified. Years. For, yeah. We'll come back to that. In golf, as you would now know, there are some players who are naturally more gifted at an early age and others who work have less natural talent but work really hard. Is car racing similar? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But uh, in, uh, you know, in, a, in a car racing, 
unfortunately, you know, it's it's a rich man's sport. Like uh, more money you have, Most money more wins. opportunity you get, and uh, and there are lots of lots of kids from a rich family, and uh, and it's it's hard to compete against them if they're very good. But mm. luckily, like most of them, not that good. You know, they uh, they just uh, they haven't earned their place. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like when you got a someone that's good and and's got money, then they go a long way. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's uh, like having talent and a work ethic. It's like having well, being Tiger Woods, all yeah, the talent and work and works harder absolutely. than everybody else. You can't beat him. He's too good. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know in the the MotoGP, the motorbikes. I don't ask me how I know this, but quite a lot of those riders will actually buy a seat. Yeah, same, same, same in is it the same, same in motor racing? racing yeah. Absolutely, same. Like it's, uh, it's uh, it was crazy. Like even my early days when I went to England and then, uh, I, like I was. T- turning up at the race meetings and uh, and just when someone got sick or thing like that and then I'll jump in the car yeah, and yeah. I drove and yeah. uh, and I had that one opportunity and I had to get most out of it and uh, and usually I did and and that led into other things then uh, because I I never had the uh, backing behind me I was lucky enough to end up driving for a people or for a factory teams you know they had the backing, and uh, That's right. but uh, obviously I, I was reasonable to be to be in a frame that they come and ask you to to drive for them. Yeah, there's something about that no choice. Is that you don't have an option. You just need to perform well in this race. You need to oh, make this cut. Yeah. It, it brings out something absolutely. in some people, doesn't it? If you're yeah. wired that way, you'll play your best and perform. Yeah, your best you, under you, that. you know you get one opportunity, and and you need to make most out of it. Yeah. And if you don't. You know, then you don't know if another opportunity will come. But like, if you if you can pay your way in, you get an opportunity after yeah. opportunity. That's right. Keep you keep, happening, keep, you know, keep, keep happening. Racing. It doesn't but, really matter. But that you know works against those kids as well because yes. they're not hungry enough. No. You know, they're not hungry enough. You know, to succeed. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Interesting stuff. Um, we skipped over some fairly, I would imagine, trying times from leaving Czechoslovakia to starting racing. Tell us about some of those and how you think they may have helped to shape you as a person and competitor. I can't help but think we see this with Lee Trevino as a prime example, a a really difficult childhood, no money, very limited opportunity, but determined because of that more so, a bit like what we were just talking about. Do you think having left Czechoslovakia and the stress of that and, and what was involved in that helps to shape and harden the competitor in some way? Well, yeah, well, I, I don't know. I don't know. But, like, uh, it was, uh, you know, it was pretty easy for me. But the other people, for other people, they're looking at me, they thought I was doing it hard. Yeah, because, like, in Czechoslovakia, I couldn't do it. No matter what you, you know, you, you couldn't, no. couldn't do it. In here, I got to Sydney, I got three jobs, and, uh, yeah. and I worked my ass off. And, and never I thought save twice up, about it, I'm sure. Never, and I, never gave I, it a second thought. And I saved up enough money to buy a race car and go racing. Wow. It's something I couldn't do in Czechoslovakia. It was easy. It was easy. Compared you know? to then that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But lots of people thought, oh, Jesus, that's, it's, that's hard because yeah. like, I never worry about where I'm going to live and all that, no. you know, like all, all the money I make, I'll, you know, I'll save up and put in a race car. Live, and then live back, in a shoebox uh, so that you can buy yeah, yourself a yeah, race Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it, it's sort of, you know, I could say the hard work sort of worked out for me and uh, and I, I sort of plan on the way to work on the car and all that. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, it sort of worked for me. And uh, I don't know if it made me any tougher or, or something like that. And uh, I probably wasn't tough enough on a, on a racetrack, you know, like they, they – no, nah, like lots of – how, how are you tough on a racetrack? How lots of – oh, well – you know, I never never punted people off really, and uh, pushed them off the track and things like that. I tried to be reasonably fair, you know. You then need uh, to lots do that of to succeed. Oh, mate, of course, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Like uh, you know, the the best blokes in a sport, best blokes in a sport. Right. You know, Michael Shoemakers and all all those. You know, like uh, they got in trouble for running people off the road and and uh, Ayrton Senna and all that. You know, then. Uh, but they were, that was different league, yeah, different different level. But uh, yeah, to, to succeed, you you know, you need to have a fair bit of 
you know what in you. Yeah. Yeah. Man, <laughs> can, man, can, mongrel, we might call can, it here. Yeah, in mongrel. Yeah, yeah, mongrel yeah, yeah. I couldn't think of that word. <laughs> I, I, know, I, know I was the one thinking, thinking about a C word, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I could tell. I'm glad we avoided that. <laughs> yeah. Before you left Czechoslovakia, and you did touch on this, uh, skiing at a national level would have been yeah, yeah, a possibility. Yeah, no, but I, was, uh, I was reasonable because uh, I, I was, uh, when I got to age of 18, I, uh, you know, it was two ways for, uh, for a kids of that age. You either go to army or you go to university. And I could do both. Yeah? I, could go, I was a good enough skier. I could go to army and ski in the army or to go to university and ski for a university so it's a team. Priv- it's a privilege because oh, yeah, of your yeah, 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 yeah. It, it was, uh, and, and I had like three offers from different universities to go and join their team and ski for them. And uh, Was it a hard and, decision not to pursue that in that case? Because I can't imagine that you just picked that up easily. There must have been a lot of work and effort going into getting that good at skiing. Was there any second uh, guessing about leaving that behind? Oh, not really, no. Right. No, no, because my mind was set, you car know, racing. like a car racing. Yeah, that's what, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. quite remarkable. It would have been people in the skiing community, I imagine, in Czechoslovakia, who thought you were crazy. Oh, I don't know about that, but uh, it's uh, like for a kind of a future, regardless, you know, it's probably was better off, you know, to – to get out of there and uh, and my dad uh, you know he always sort of said you know it's not much future in here and uh, you know like he definitely wasn't against it when uh, when I told him like I'm bloody not coming back you know I'm going Which I imagine would have caused some trouble for him oh yeah yeah, the family yeah, yeah 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 no it was, no, upon, like, it, it? Like, it, it was going through the through the tough times yeah. through the tough times yeah with the secret police arriving and uh and taking him for a questioning and all this bloody crap and uh, yeah, it, it, it was it was a bit tough. It was a bit tough for for him there. Yeah. there. There will be listeners thinking we've lifted this from a movie plot. <laughs> that, that if you grow up in Australia, you can't imagine these things happening. Ah, it's, well, it's unimaginable. But it, uh, they did, didn't they? They I, really did. I tell you, it was uh, you know my wife. She's was no not Australian but, you know from from England but grew up in Australia and uh, she's not like Australian. like born uh, in England not Australian yeah yeah well, she she Australian. speaks like us <laughs> yeah, speaks like me and uh, yeah like she couldn't believe you know the things I was no. was telling her like it it, it it was hard to sort of you know to to take in and uh, and she asked me why you know like and it was hard to explain you know, like I. I remember when uh, I took her back there, the end of communism, you know, like there was the end of communism in 89. And uh, we were living in England back then, then uh, we went there for Christmas. And even then she she, she couldn't believe it when she saw, saw him there. Because mm. yeah. because the West didn't know, did we? We didn't know what was happening on the other side. Yeah, yeah, Iron yeah. Yeah, and yeah. When those stories yeah. came out and... Remarkable. Different world, different world. L- literally a different yeah, world, different totally different. World. And a different yeah. life experience. Yeah. A, a friend of mine married a Polish girl who lived in Australia here for many years with him but always had a sense of paranoia about things. It never left her. Yeah, yeah, always yeah. worried that somebody would be listening to phone calls. or And we would think, what are you worried? Nobody's going to listen to your phone yeah, calls. Yeah. But she had grown up in a place where people would yeah. listen to your phone yeah, calls. You, it was real. Sort of, yeah. And, and yeah. for her yeah. – you, you, never like let, you couldn't let, say the things you, you know, no. you think. Yeah. You know, it, it was, uh, you, you, you could get yourself in trouble yeah. and, uh, and uh, just, uh, you know, your career would have been bloody, uh, you know, like I tell you about my dad. You know, my dad, he, he was always like anti-communist, yeah, because as you know, like uh, before even – the three years after the Second World War, like like the Czech, Czechoslovakia, it, it, it was like a Western Western yeah, world, a yeah, wonderful, until, proud nation with a beautiful yeah, history and, and, and architecture and and uh, and uh, Dad's uncle, you know, he had a huge farm, and uh, you know that farm got taken away from him, you know, when the when the communists uh, arrived in 1948, three years after the end of the war, you know, the farm got confiscated. They, they just okay now this belongs to us and uh, and you can work for us in here. They talk to, to his, you know. It's unthinkable even uncle, now, isn't it? You, you, you know, like it's. Uh, what would you say in those and, circumstances? Uh, and, and Dad, you know, 
always because of that. Then uh, that was a little bit, you know, like uh, anti-communist. And, and in uh, 1968, in the early of 1968, like the the kind of you know government was turning around in uh, in Czechoslovakia. They uh, there was an organization that my, my dad went to one meeting, right. one meeting, yeah, and it was the anti anti communist organization, and he put a signature there, sign in, and went to one meeting, and that was haunted him for the rest of his life. Wow. Yeah, for the rest of his life until you know oh, for the next it was for the next. Uh, over twenty years, for you having, know, just for just because just, just because he went to that meeting, yeah, and uh, and was class as an anti They they took his passport away. My dad didn't have a passport. Goodness me! They uh, he couldn't go even to bloody Poland. It takes know? great courage, doesn't it, under it's, circumstances uh, like that to be a part of? Because there was there was always in the Eastern Bloc country that mm. there were people who did speak out and agitate yeah, for yeah, change. That took great yeah, courage yeah, to do that. Yeah. Enormous yeah. courage. But, uh, you know, they they knew how to deal with those people. Yeah. yeah. Well, although in hindsight you wonder, ultimately the system failed, didn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, I had for to all fa- of those yeah, reasons. But we never thought it would fail. No, you of course. Know, I, when you're in it, I could imagine. I never even thought, like, it's uh, it was crazy because, like, I was, uh, as I told you, I was in England from uh, 85 85, no, 86 till 90, I was in England. While I was there, my mom got quite ill, and uh, and I wanted to come and see her. I went to a Czech embassy in uh, in London, and I, I said, well, this is the situation. What, what what do I need to do like to go back there? And uh, it was a huge process. Like, you know, you need to ask for a pardon. You need to cancel your Czech citizenship. You know, you need to you need to apply then uh, for visa, and if you do all this, well, it's not guarantee. We, we still give you the visas. You know, then uh, it we, was a huge process. Then I had to pay. Oh, then you had to pay for all the education. Right. You had to pay for all your education the country gave you. Right. Yeah? Then I, well, yeah, in England I paid about I don't know two thousand pounds or something right. for my education. Two months after I paid it, was the end of <laughs> communism. I didn't have to do that. I never got the money back. <laughs> it, it's it's like the house you don't buy, Thomas. You know yeah, the house yeah, you were yeah. in there was it was yeah. six thousand dollars and now it just but, sold uh, for eight million and you yeah, could have bought it but you yeah, didn't. It's like that. Yeah. Were you uh, worried about stupid. that? Were you nervous about going back under those circumstances? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I was kind of a bit nervous going to a Czech embassy there, you yeah. know. Then, uh, but uh, yeah, that's you know, it it, it was sort of. Uh, yeah, I had to do it, you know. I, I had to go and see my mom. But then at the end, like even before then, we managed to meet uh, in Berlin. I went to West Berlin. They went to East Berlin and we met Checkpoint Charlie, just, you know. Then, uh, that's yeah. Hard. That's heartbreaking, uh, isn't it? To, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and yeah, yeah but it's two, you know, two different worlds back then. Yes. It was two completely two different worlds. We'll, we'll come to the golf and, in a minute, I yeah. promise. But well, there's not much talk about golf. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure there wasn't much golf in Czechoslovakia <laughs> at the time. But I wonder, Thomas, in the same way that you, when you're living in that circumstance, can't ever see that it's going to fail or change, oh. we take for granted, do we not, in places like Australia – that it will always be like this, and that right. and that it can't be taken away from us, and that's a there's a danger there, isn't there? Well, I tell you, the people whinging and carrying on in here, but like it's uh, you, you don't know how lucky how lucky the people are here. Yeah, yeah, they they don't. You know, no, the, the we don't. Problem yeah. problem is the people don't don't appreciate that sometimes. No. Yeah, I know. Every time I've been overseas, which hasn't been often. But I distinctly remember coming back from a trip to Egypt and on the plane back saying to myself, I will never complain about anything in Australia ever again. And a week later, I found myself complaining because I was in North Sydney or Crozes and there wasn't a rubbish bin for me to throw yeah. my rubbish yeah. in. <laughs> and, you know, and you catch yourself. Yeah. Yeah. The more entitled, the more you have, the more entitled you feel. Correct. Yeah. And you don't appreciate what you do have. And there's, there's, uh, there's dangers in that. At Drum and Golf, we understand your passion. Nice roll. And that's because every Drummond Golf store is owned and run by a local who loves the game as much as you do. Yeah, it's come off the face really well. Someone who knows where you play and what you need. Oh, yeah. Looking good. With Australia's biggest range and expert knowledge. Great. Now let's try that putter with this grip. So if you want to improve your game, see a local expert at Drummond Golf. 
let's come to the golf. So, yeah. the age of 30, you're racing cars in England, and somehow you end up playing golf. Tell us how that came to be, because the two sports, one wouldn't assume from the outside that most racing car drivers would have much interest in going to play golf, oh, but we must be wrong about that. As I said, that's one game I had there, and then, uh, and I got hooked, and then every every spare time ever since, you know, like over there, I went to play golf, and uh, and I I really yeah I got hooked on it, and I, I enjoyed it. Then I started follow it on TV as well, and watching it like those days, like it was the days of Sevi Ballesteros and uh, and then Nick Faldo and uh, Norman, and it was uh, yeah Norman, and it was just great to. You know, watching them there on TV big, and all the big oh yeah yeah big yeah game. yeah was, yeah was, yeah, was yeah. Was and uh, and suddenly I, I start to learn a little bit about about golf yeah, yeah. Then, then the magazine and, and all that yeah and yeah you, know, you think what have, yeah. I, what have I done why yeah. do I do all yeah. of this like the people don't realize the feeling. You connect in the middle of the club, and that ball goes two hundred meters or whatever. Yeah, you know, like it's. Uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, that, that sort of things brings you back. And, and yeah. people who don't play golf, who, who've never played golf, can't appreciate that. And unless you go to the golf and watch professional golfers play, you can't appreciate what they do. To stand behind Adam Scott, which I remember doing a couple of years ago, on the ninth tee at the Australian, and watch him hit a three-wood it was just a thing of beauty. They should have hung it in the loo. Yeah, yeah. Just this extraordinary ball, low, and you could hear it fizz, and then it raised up, and then it just turned right to left, maybe three or four yards, and came down and released in the front. Amazing to watch, but you can't get that on TV. On TV, it just looks like a player yeah, yeah, swings a club, yeah. and then he goes yeah. down, hits it from yeah. from yeah, someone. Yeah, so. Like it's same as. You know, model racing. Yeah, yeah. You know, the TV doesn't do it justice. You watch Bathurst on TV, it doesn't do it justice. The you inclination, you, how high, right. uh, you know, uphill and downhill and all that. Like, uh, same with golf. Yeah. yeah. Like, and the uh, feel, they tell you about and, uh, motor racing. The feel of the noise, you feel it inside. Uh, Is that right? Yeah, the thumping yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, bass, yeah, it's, it's the, just, the engines. Yeah. 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 No, nothing better than a Great sound of V8. Spoken <laughs> <laughs> like a true boy who never grew up despite being older these days. So you were the archetypal golf nut by the sound of it. Like many of our readers and listeners, this is the lifestyle they have. If there's a way to cram golf into any kind of a trip away, be it a weekend away, be it a oh. Saturday afternoon where they've got nothing else booked, they'll go and do it. That's still quite a long way from in your 50s deciding I'll have a crack at Q school. So, how good did you get as an amateur? Did you have a handicap, or were you a uh, yeah, just a yeah, vagabond yeah. Like golfer I, who I wandered came, around? I came back to Australia at the end of 1990, and I uh, come back to Gold Coast, and uh, and I joined a club. Up, uh, the first club I joined was up at Mount Tambourine, like okay. nine holes, nine holes sort of Proper course golf. there. Real, real golf, then, uh, real golf with real. Yeah, people. yeah, yeah, and uh, sneakers, you know, hand, no gloves, and in <laughs> bloody three cards or something started of handicap 24 or. And, uh, you know, like, I was, I absolutely loved it, you know, absolutely loved it. Like and did you improve quickly? Well, yeah, yeah, it was, it was sort of getting better and better and better. And, uh, and then I got a, got a good, uh, good job to drive for Holden, you know, got a good oh, offer. racing team, did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, yeah, with yeah. Peter Brock? Yeah, well, he wasn't there first year. Like, first year I was there by myself. Right. Next year was Wayne Gardner. Wow. My teammate. Well, of course, yes, because he stopped yeah, raising yeah, the price yeah, into the car. Yeah. I remember that. And and then uh, and then Brocky after that. Well, yeah, that's they, Australian royalty. They, if you if you'd driven a car they, with Shane Warne, that would be the trifecta. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, because of uh, you know, it was a great job. Then uh, I had uh, you know when I wasn't racing or, or, or doing testing or, or doing some PR work, then then I was practicing and playing golf and. Uh, you know, I got to listen, then I got to single figures, and, oh. uh, and then I got. Now you're really in trouble. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> then, uh, then I got a little better. I joined a better club in here at Arundel, Arundel Hills, which just shut Not, down. No actually. longer with us. That's right. Yeah, yeah it was That's real right. shame, real shame, and uh, yeah, and I, and I sort of chipping, chipping away at it, and uh, and because uh, because of Holden being involved in golfing as well. Yeah, that's right. They were huge. They like, scramble, and they had the Holden Young Lions, if I recall. They sponsored and, and all they, those young players. Yeah, and they also sponsor Norman. That's right. Greg Norman Classic. Then, uh, 
And uh, they the Australian Open, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Holden yeah, Australian Open, yeah. yeah. And uh, therefore, suddenly Holden's flying me all over the country <laughs> to go play in a pro M there, playing with the Greg Norman in you a pro with, M. You played with yeah, Greg Norman. Yeah, Where yeah, about yeah, so yeah, What was that like? It it was. Uh, he'll never forget it, and I'll <laughs> never forget it. It was. We played. Uh, it was at the lakes. It was. I think. Was it the Holden Classic or would've something? Been, yeah, yeah, something like that. Mm-hmm. And in a in a pro am, it was uh, obviously Norman, you know, and uh, and supposed to be Kerry Pecker, and supposed and and uh, and was a managing director's wife of Holden, Juanita Hamel, Bill Hamel, big American, and she was brilliant. She was brilliant. Anyway, she loved golf, and uh, you know, and that that and myself, that was the force. And, but uh, in a in a kind of in the last minute. You know, Kerry Packer struck lucky in casino somewhere in Las Vegas or something. <laughs> didn't make it back in time. Didn't make it in time. Then a quick re- replacement was uh, the name was Harry Watts. Of, I, I never forget it. Head of Colts. Head of Colts. Woolworths. I remember. Of I remember what happened. Tell the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, I said, I've got a photo still at home on a first tee, or all, all four of us on a first tee. And uh, anyway, we go to the thirteen hole, and then uh, suddenly Harry. Bloody on the ground. Like he had a massive heart attack. Yeah. Massive died heart attack. Right in the and middle of the fair. Well, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Like there were 200 people following us. Course, there were yeah. doctors among them immediately started the CPR yeah. and all that. Couldn't bring him back. Yeah. Like it was, it was very sad, that's, you know, and that's one. It's awful. You know, Greg will never forget no, that. No, and no, I'll no. never that's forget that. Not. And I can say, well, I could have beat. Norman, but we didn't finish, you <laughs> know. Yeah. Then, uh, I had him on the road. Yeah, I, had him, I was yeah, just about to deliver yeah, the knockout yeah, yeah, punch. Yeah, yeah. That's a, then, uh, it's a it's a hideous thing to happen, isn't it? Well, oh, course, it, was, it was very sad. Norman would have been not unexcited to play with you too. He's a speed freak and likes his cars, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, like he was sort of a uh, good mate with Nigel, Nigel Mansell, Mansell, I that's think. Right. And, and I think he got Mansell to he did. play, play yeah. in, a, South, in the Open in the South, or something. South Australian Open. Yeah, South yeah, 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 yeah. Because he was a two-marker maybe, not? Then, uh, yeah. And if, yeah, no, no, he, he could play. Yeah, yeah Nigel, Nigel Mansell yeah. could play. Yeah, he's probably probably one of the bravest from Formula One still alive, right. you know. All the other brave ones killed themselves, you know. But uh, he was unbelievable in Formula One. And uh, Anyway, then Holden's flying me and this, like, flew me to Adelaide. I, I remember I played with Glenn Joyner because uh, – wow. That was saying we were sponsored by Bridgestone. We used Bridgestone tyres, yeah. and Joyner was uh, Bridgestone clubs, Bridgestone clubs or something. And uh, anyway, then uh, you know they flew me there. I, I played with Joyner in the <laughs> program, and that was the first time I met him. And he still remembers <laughs> because sometimes we get to play together now on a on a tour, Obviously, and he sure. still remembers as well. You must have started to resent having to go to races, Thomas. It's starting to interfere with your golf uh, well, calendar. <laughs> well, I did. You know, like I always, you know, kept telling them we should sort of, uh, you know. Cut down on testing a little yeah, bit. That's you know, right. I have, We're working I the cars more, too hard. That's right. Play Let's more golf. Give them the weekend off so I can go. Yeah, anyway, play. then, uh, you know, then I, I had lots of free time and I, I put lots of time into it. And uh, I should have taken lessons, but I. So you've I, not I, had I, lessons? No, not really. Even Those days, no, no, I was too bloody stubborn, you know. Then, and, uh, well, you got this far anyway, on your own, didn't you? So you can understand. Yeah, this, yeah, that, you? yeah. And uh, anyway, then, you know, like when I stopped racing, I was 44. I think with my last race was 44. Uh, started immediately after the, the job with Porsche. Then I sort of said, "Yeah, no, like I've been bloody racing all my life, doing something, competing, and uh, wouldn't mind to have a crack at this bloody senior still." Then, uh, and I gave myself like five years to get the handicap down to to get better. And uh, yeah, then I got to two handicap. And and kind of play to it. Then uh, I so, said, oh, you know, I have a go at this two school. Then, uh, you know, played about two grand or something entry fee and uh, went to Camden Lakeside in, yeah. you know, yeah. Peter Thompson course with bloody bunkers in the middle of the fairways. On the other side of a hill, you can't even, it just looks like a hill in the fair. When you get on the other side, you're in a bunker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, uh, and... Uh, yeah, and I, I made it. I, I put three rounds together. Like I remember last round, I shot three under sixty nine and uh, and finished second behind Krishna Singh. Yeah. Then uh, yeah, then I, I I got on a tour and I thought, watch, oh, that's easy, you know, not, not a big deal. And uh, how hard can it be? <laughs> then uh, yeah, yeah. Then you know, suddenly you realise, oh, geez, you know, the job's not done because I had to five years in a row. 
I had to finish in a in the top sixty on a mm-hmm. on a money order. Keep your card. And uh, to keep the card. And uh, like you know, first year I, I did it all right. Like second year I did it, and and then it was getting harder and harder. And I remember like. I think it was my last year, you know, I, I did it on a number by about 170 bucks. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Then, uh, and then, uh, then I kept my card forever. After, and I, and I, yeah, that. yeah. And I, I'm sort of very proud yeah, of it. That you, was, uh, yeah. you know, because I'm, I'm not a golfer, you know, I still see myself, you know, I'm a race car driver, but, uh, well, yeah. you know, sometimes Reasonably I, I love the golf. Game, I love clearly. golf. Yeah. Uh, just to go on a tangent, it, it reminds me, I, I, Poor man can never forget it. Brad Hughes missed out on the 125th spot on the PGA Tour one year by $127. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And and never played the PGA Tour again. Never yeah. got back. Yeah, yeah. And that, like I've, I've, That's just he, – it's cruel. Yeah, it is. It is yeah, no, I, I can tell you <laughs> like uh, it's a sort of different different appreciation of mm-hmm. looking the, the blokes. They make it for a living. I play it for fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's uh, right. For enjoyment. Yes. I, I love it. But the blokes, to make money out of it, to survive on it. Pay a mortgage. Oh, my. Have a car. And God. Like the, yeah. the stress, you know, they go through and all that. Like, I really admire those blokes. And uh, Golf fans don't understand, do we? We, oh. we, we, we? When we think of professional golf, we think of Tiger and Rory and Adam and private jets and turn up and – Play golf, and somebody gives you a couple hundred thousand bucks, and you go to a corporate day, and that's not the it's not the case for most people <laughs> it's, playing it's, professional it's the, golf. It's the case for a bloody top twenty in the world or right. something, but uh, you know, even on the, on the the seniors who are are playing now, it is it is quite competitive now, and lots of good blokes, and uh, and well, few of them try to survive on it, and uh, that's hard to do, and and it's 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 very difficult, but. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll really step back and look up to them because, uh, you know, it, it is, it is something like, uh, Jesus, I, I tell you, I wouldn't want to go through then, uh, most people in your situation who come to the game a bit later in life, particularly if they've got some aptitude for it and they get quite good, even though they've taken it up late and they're better than their friends who've been playing their whole life. Most of them will think, I wish if I'd taken this up years ago, I could have been a pro. Well, you've been a pro now. Do you reckon you could have? If you'd found golf at the age of when you left, well, um, yeah. What do you reckon? Could you have made it? I don't. I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't have made it to you know. Probably would have made it to get the card or something, but never would have made it the way I made it in motorsport when I could make a living out of it and survive on that for uh, so many years. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is definitely one of the one of the hardest sports I. I ever tried, and because it's so hard, you know, like you it's know, relentless, you, isn't it? You, you're drawn to it, you know, because you want to, you want to test yourself yeah. against the best, and it's yeah. relentless. Yeah, yeah the, yeah. the good shot yeah. you just hit means nothing because now you've got to play the next one, and it could just as easily be a bad shot. And uh, and it's and actually actually going back, something common between motor racing and golf is the confidence. Uh huh. You know, in motor racing, you got a good car that gives you good confidence. That gives you that little extra. In golf, you got to hit four hundred good shots to get a confidence, yeah, but right. it only takes two bad shots, <laughs> one bad right. shot to lose it very quickly. Go all the way back yeah, to square yeah. one. Do not pass. Yeah, go. Do yeah. not collect. Yeah, the confidence. Yeah, I suppose it's in any sport. Yeah. 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 Interesting. They're two such different pursuits. I wonder how you got hooked on golf. When sort of speed, there's a lot of golfers who are into cars, and I kind of understand that a bit more. There's a, there's a kind of a for a lot of blokes, cars from the time they're little are fascinating, aren't they? Richard Green, I think, owns a yeah, bunch yeah, of race yeah. cars, oh, and Richard. Wade Ormsby is a big yeah. car guy. Peter Lonard loves his cars. I think he's got a big truck now as well. Those kind of things. That direction you can kind of understand. They've devoted their life to golf, and the speed thing would be thrilling. But going the other way, what do you think the appeal was for you? From from uh, speed to no speed. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it was it was the challenge of it. Mm. Yeah, I, I would say the challenge. Yeah, and it it still remains there. Like every time it, you go tee up, doesn't matter if it's just in a in a, in a club competition or if it's in a pro am or if it's in a bigger tournament. You know, it's the challenge of it. Yeah, yeah and and that's what I love. 
It's the personal challenge, isn't it? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah a, absolutely. And uh, and and you can't blame the bloody mechanics. You can't blame the car. You can't blame the tires. You can't blame you the caddy? engine. Have you got a caddy? <laughs> then, you need a no, caddy. You got to have a caddy no, to blame. <laughs> then uh, you know it, it, it's really it, it's you. Yeah. 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 All of it, the good yeah. and the bad, yeah. which is the appeal, yeah. isn't it? The yeah. highs are really yeah. high. When you do something really good, nobody else can take any credit. Yeah. You've done that all on your own. And similarly, when you do something really bad. Are you a better player now than when you qualified for the tour, do you think? Oh, yeah, I, I definitely. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, I, I get I get more help now than when I, when I started sort of playing and uh, – like in uh, in our club, like uh, actually today as well, you know, like I'm on a range and Ozzy comes over, Ozzy Moore, and uh, you know, just always, you know, have a look and yeah, oh, yeah, that's actually not bad. Oh, you know, you should be, you should be <laughs> shooting better. I said no, 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 because I'm putting bad, you know, like I've got yips, you know, and uh, things like that. But uh, but he comes, uh, you know, and helps me a little bit and just just gives me something to work yeah. on and, uh, and yeah, I, I which bet, is great, yes. which is great. I'm, I'm thinking I'm hitting the ball better than I ever did. There's but, a wonderful uh, collegiality amongst professional golfers, isn't there? I think there's a natural respect. Very rare that a fellow professional, if you were to ask them for help, would say no. Oh, yeah, yeah, All absolutely. Would completely, say, yeah, sure, let me have a look. Completely okay. different than in motorsport. Yeah, of course. You know, you know in, a, in a motorsport, they, they have uh, – you've got 10 drivers, you know, chasing the same sponsor. Yeah. And they're backstabbing each other and all that. And, uh, you know, golf is more camaraderie. You it's know, almost like, perverse, like it, isn't it's, it, uh, Thomas? Yeah. You, you, you want to help the other players so that they can be at their best so that when you beat them, there's a great then, sense uh, of yeah, pride yeah, because you beat them when they were at their best. Something <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah. And and I get you know I I, I get lots of help from the fellow professionals yeah. like on a tour, yeah. like all the time, all the time. We're on a practice range and and the blokes I travel with, you know, uh, Brad Burns, you know, Burns is uh, is very good and uh, very knowledgeable, you know, Tickle, Mark Tickle and uh, Chris Taylor and. Uh, and anyone else, like on a on a bloody putting green, or like whoever, Stacey's, oh, maybe you should try this. And it, it, it's really good. Yes, yeah, it's, it, it's really really nice. W- wouldn't happen in modest. No, no, no. no. Well, and they, you all they, still share the same sickness. They try to break it. No, that's exactly <laughs> right. While you're not looking, yeah, yeah, cut the brake yeah, lines, so, yeah. so that you uh, so that you don't. What were the strengths of your game that got you to the tour? What was it? What is what part of your game do you think? Given that you've not had lessons, you're self taught. Took up the game at 30, qualified for a professional tour at the age of, you would have been 50, 51? 52. 52 yeah, yeah. at the time. It's a, f- a fairy tale story in some ways. What do you uh, sort of put it down to? I, I, I probably could chip all right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, you know, chipping saves my ass. It's a crucial <laughs> part know? of the game, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. If I can add the moment, like up, up. Used to putt all right, but you know, it comes and goes with a bit of putting. Yeah, then uh, I think we all know the uh, down, Thomas, that putting yeah, is not a skill, yeah, is it? It's yeah, black magic. If I, That's the truth of it, isn't it? If I could uh, putt the way I chipped, then uh, I'll, I'll probably have a better scores. Yeah. What do you think happens to putting? I was talking to Charlie Earp this morning about this. I interviewed Charlie this morning, and we were trying to think of a really good or great player whose putting did not ultimately desert them later on in their career. And the only person we could really come up with was Ben Crenshaw. But putting seems to, even the great putters, it does not stay forever, does it? Yeah, it, it comes and goes. Like, you know, same as same as anything with that game. Yeah, I, I always thought it's only happening to me, but uh, <laughs> you know, it happens to to much much better players. You've only you got know? to look at the and, racks uh, of putters in the pro it's, shop. Uh, it's not just yeah, you, Thomas, the yeah, options that are available. Yeah. Yeah, but like, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in golf, but like watching it, like uh, another bloke you're talking about putting, I think it's that Kevin Kisner. Mm-hmm. You know, I always kept saying, just imagine if Adam Scott could putt like Kevin Kisner. Yeah. You know, then, uh, yeah. The most it's dangerous a, word in golf, Thomas, if. 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 Yeah, if if, if I'd hit one less shot. Yeah, yeah, if, yeah. if I'd got it out of that bunker. Yeah. If you could drive yourself mad with it. And that would be a lesson that you would have learned and, uh, playing professionally, I imagine. You can't second guess, can you? You could drive yourself mad at the, oh, end of the tournament. Yeah, you know, like you, you can't go You can't go sort of, you know, you're going to make a decision, stick to it. Yeah. 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 You can't say, oh, you should have, would have. 
you know. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, no, it, it, particularly in golf. There's just it's a that's a road to perdition. You, you mentioned earlier, and we were talking about this before we started recording, this sort of appreciation that you've gained for people who've made a living playing the game for all that time. Talk a little bit for people who've probably not thought about that much. What do you mean by that? What is it that you sort of see that we don't see that makes you think this is really quite a remarkable thing to have done with a life? Oh uh, no, you, because you. You know, you experience it. You, you you sort of play the same course as as those blokes do. You get in the same positions, then how they deal with it. You know, like it's uh, the the golf is very much. You know, it's almost all in the head, up, up there, up there in the head. And uh, more experience you have, then uh, you know, I, I still don't think like the top players think. You know that that that's that's where I'm I'm lacking with with my decisions. Yeah. You know, like I, I get to, to some shots and uh, and I come up with something completely stupid. <laughs> <laughs> then as soon as you hit it, you think yeah. yourself, that was the wrong that, shot. That, that, Why would I have done that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it it's with the, it comes with the experience and uh, and all that, and it's just amazing how the people sing their way around the, around the golf yeah. course. Like I, I remember once I had a good practice round played with Craig Warren. Okay, you know Craig played well in the Japanese Beautiful tour, golf. and uh, yeah, golf. yeah, yeah. And uh, he said, "Oh, I just come play play nine holes," and and he kind of talked me through it, you know. And I, oh, I pick up a lot yeah. in a way, you know. But uh, then you forget it, you of know, you, because you you go back to your all normal, yep. you know, bad decisions. But uh, it was just fantastic, and uh, you know, it's, it's it's the it's the mental approach mm. what I can see from uh, from the good golfers, the mel- mental approach and their attitude and uh, their attitude when the thing goes bad to bloody wipe it out forget about it and uh, you know I'm, I'm, I'm still bloody steaming <laughs> over it for the three holes later, later. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but they just bang down you know, press on and, uh, and yeah. move on I think it was Bob Jones who said did he not that golf is a game of continually learning the same lessons you learn the lesson you have the aha moment you play beautifully for a couple of holes or for a couple of rounds or for a couple of weeks, and then one day, in ex- for no reason at all, you've forgotten it, yeah. and you're back to can't play again. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? And I think Absolutely. that every yeah. golfer listening yeah. will be nodding their head furiously, saying, yeah. that's exactly what it's yeah. like. Why can't you yeah. just hang on to it yeah. and, uh, and, and keep it? For you, what does golf mean to you now, Thomas? Obviously, you, you know, you're playing the tour and there's money to play for and those sorts of things, though you're not doing it for your living. Why do you keep? doing it because i imagine there must be times when it's incredibly frustrating oh well it is frustrating but uh it uh it keeps me keeps me fit Mm -hmm. keeps keeps me the motivation to do my stretching and to do my bloody exercise i'm getting on i'm getting on and uh i'm 64 i'll be 65 soon you can't be if then you look that, like this at sixty four, I'm not buying it. Then uh, yeah, well, I'll be sick. You know, Tick is Tick is making fun out of me. I'll be double dipping with the super seniors. <laughs> you know, at the end of the end of the end of the year, and uh, yeah, it, it, it just keeps me fit and uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, it keeps keeps me going. So like I, I, I just always look forward to. Like I'll, I'll be going oh, on Saturday. I'm going out, going to to Adelaide. Okay. You know, it's always something to look forward yeah. to, and I, I, I just can't wait. And and, uh, and lucky enough, I've got very understanding wife. Like <laughs> she's used to that from my motor racing days when I wasn't at home much. And uh, sometimes she went with me to motor racing, but not very often. And same with golf. Sometimes she comes with me, but very she's rare, glad. very rare. She's, she thinks I'm mad. She, she thinks the bloody tri- chasing that white ball, you know. She's glad to be rid of you. She gets the house yeah, to herself. Yeah, she's yeah, got yeah, to put yeah. up with you yeah. and all your nonsense and carry yeah. on watching the golf. Yeah, cetera, absolutely, cetera, cetera. absolutely. How many yeah. events roughly do you play a year? Well, uh, there are roughly about 80 events. And uh, and I'll if I play about third, you know, then, uh, yeah. The, the, Anything close to home, and then you'll pick and choose some that you. Might yeah, yeah. Well, on. it's hard to get a start as well. Yeah, and, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. Then uh, I try to play where I get the starts, and uh, and it fits around work sometimes yeah. as well. Then uh, unfortunately, have to have to work a little. 
Then, uh, well, you can't rely on but, golf uh, to make a living, Thomas. No, it'd be madness. No, no, <laughs> Nobody no, can no, make a no, living no, playing no, golf. That's, no, uh, I can't. No, that's, no. Uh, that's crazy. Well, it's been fabulous to catch up with you. It's an amazing story in so many ways. And uh, I'm sure lots of people who remember you from your car racing days, some might not have realised that you played the tour now. They'll be onto the PGA website looking up your results, which would be fantastic. I must also say a thank you to Park the Club yeah, here at Parkwood, who – very generously lent us a room to record the podcast in today and they didn't have to do that and that was very kind of them. So thank you, Tom. It's been great to meet you and really no, appreciate no, that. No, no, no. Thanks to, you know, to be part of this. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it was good. I enjoyed it. Well, that. during my research, yeah, I, I discovered that. you've done some motor racing podcasts. So you're still a somebody in motor racing, so it's uh, nice that you get some recognition in golf as well. Yeah. Been fantastic. Thank you. Cheers, Rob. Well, there's lots of professional golfers who like fast cars, but it'd be difficult to imagine many of Thomas's former teammates keeping pace with him on the golf course. Big thanks to Thomas for taking the time to chat, and we wish him all the best on his travels this year. Now, on our next, a very special guest joins John Huggan to talk one of the most successful careers in golf history. You know, I'm always hesitant to to criticize or to talk about the change in the game because... I don't want to become that old curmudgeon that sounds like, well, back in 1982, we did, you know, it, it you don't want to sound that way. I, but that being said, the, the skill set that the young player has today is fascinating. It's amazing what they're able to do, the power, but the set of skills that it takes to be a successful tour player or worldwide player now is just a totally different set of skills than we had 30 years ago. That's President's Cup captain Jim Furyk next time on The Thing About Golf.